now let us read together in the Word of God, in the Gospel according to St. Mark, the second chapter, beginning at verse 1, and we read the first twelve verses. The story of yet another encounter with Jesus. Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, at verse 1. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room for them, not even about the door, and he was preaching the word to them. And they came, from the other Gospels, we, we know the story of the man's friends, they came bringing to Jesus a paralytic carried by four men. He was, li he was lying on his, his bedding rug. And they picked him up and carried him to Jesus. Verse 4. And when they could not get near Jesus because of the crowd, they went round to the side of the house and went up the outside stairs and got onto the roof. And of course it wasn't solid wood and tiles and that kind of thing. It was possibly a rush matting. When they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, and of course faith is visible, just as unbelief is visible. It's a disturbing thought at times. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. It was a bit of a public occasion to be speaking to a man about his sins. My son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak thus? It is, it is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, you see, even your secret thinking eh, is not secret to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question thus in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your, ba your pallet, and walk. But that you may know beyond any shadow of doubt that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your bed and go home. And he rose, and immediately took up the pallet and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Amen, and may God bless to our hearts the reading of his word. This story of the paralytic or the man sick of the palsy as it's recorded in the authorized version is a story that is given to us by all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke. And the more you read the story, the more you discover it is fascinating, it is instructive and it is really very, very encouraging eh, whoever we are and whatever we are. Think of it in this way. There may be people here this morning who feel that they are like the paralytic. Their life and their personality are in bondage to such an extent that they are not only shattered and bitter, they are really resigned. They really feel that this, this is just them, this is what they are like. This is what they've been for years and years and years, and they, they can't get out of it, and it's all pretty hopeless, and in a very real sense, they're paralytic. 
Well, the story tells us that Jesus answered that kind of need with accuracy and with power. On the other hand, there may be people here this morning who are like the friends of this paralyzed man. You, you may have someone specific or a number of people very, very much on your heart. You may be tremendously worried about these people or this person. You, you may have shed tears. You may be worried sick about them. But what's dominant in your thoughts is that, that they and their situation are quite beyond you. You don't know what to do. Well, the only thing to do is to bring them to Jesus. That's what this man's friends did. They brought him to Jesus. And even when we cannot bring people to Jesus in the physical sense, then we can bring them to Jesus in the prayer of faith and simply present them before Jesus. You'll notice that once these fellows had knocked a hole in the roof and lowered the stretcher down in front of Jesus, they didn't say anything, they just, they didn't ask anything. They didn't give any information to Jesus, they didn't give any advice to Jesus. They, they had done what was required of them. They had brought this needy person, they had laid him down in front of Jesus, and they just waited to see what Jesus was going to do. Or on the other hand, there may be people here this morning who feel, eh, most of all, that they're like the disciples who were with Jesus in the house. People who are very, 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 very aware of all the need that is represented in the human situation that crowds round about us day after day. And I'm sure there are many people here who feel increasingly a deep, deep desire in their hearts to do something about it. But you know, my friends, in the basic spiritual and theological and practical sense, there is nothing that we can do, and this is one thing that this story insists that we should learn. Only Jesus can work salvation. And in this situation with a crowd of people and the stretcher led down with the paralyzed man lying upon it, you will notice, if you consider it carefully and try to imagine it, that every eye was upon Jesus. The fellows up in the roof looking down, they were looking to Jesus. The disciples were looking to Jesus. The people, having had a glance at the man, were looking to Jesus. And this, you see, is basic and essential teaching with regard to the whole of Christian service. If, if we go out to the service of the gospel believing that we can do something, then we'll fail. Think of the words of the great apostle in 1 Corinthians. Paul may plant, but he really can't do anything. Apollos may water, but he really can't do anything. It is God who gives the increase. It is only God. And this is something that ministers and missionaries must learn and learn and relearn and learn yet again. The only worker is God Almighty through his Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see what I mean when I say that this story is fascinating and instructive and encouraging. The whole thing serves to focus upon Jesus, and we've got to try to apply it in the fullest possible way to ourselves. And we'll start like this. Have you, for example, ever been brought to church against your will? For all I know, there may be people here this morning who didn't want to come. But pressure was brought to bear upon you, and you're here. I suppose there are lots of intriguing moments in a minister's life, and you do become aware on a number of different occasions, whether it's at baptisms or weddings or funerals, that there are people who have been obliged to come. They don't like churches and they don't like preachers and they don't like being preached at. And sometimes you see them and they, you say, oh, I, I've watched it here in our own place. You see them and they, they, oh, they scrutinize the stained glass windows. 
they'll look at the pillars, they'll look, but every now and again, just, just as if there was some unseen part, they're, they're brought back and they're having to listen. And they don't like it and they, they look away and they bite their fingernails and they look at their watches. They didn't want to be there. They had to be there for, because of some reason or other. They were brought, uh, perhaps with protest, they were brought under constraint and they had to listen. Of course, there's the other side of it. There are those that... To your surprise, you discover, had been listening very intently. I remember at one funeral service at Mary Hill Crematorium, after the people were all filing out, I noticed one el el elderly gentleman uh, hanging back, and I thought, well, I didn't understand. It. I didn't know him, but I went up and spoke to him. And to my utter astonishment, he began to say to me, Sir, I would not in any sense call myself a believing man. But never in all my life have I felt myself so near to God as today. I didn't expect that at a funeral. The great thrill about being in the service of Jesus Christ is that you really never know what is happening. But if you have ever been brought to a church or to some similar situation under protest against your will, you will know, I think, in measure how this paralyzed man felt. Because I think it's open to question in the story whether or not he wanted to be there. I, I become increasingly persuaded that this man was just fizzing with annoyance at his friends. When they began to pick up, they, what, what are you doing? We are taking you to... Oh, no, you are not. But you see, he was paralyzed. There wasn't much he could do about it. And they hoisted him up. I, I've got a fairly vivid imagination. I can imagine the kind of things that this man might have been saying to his friends. But you know, sometimes friends serve us best by refusing to listen to us. And they marched along the road with this man. And wh whether he was spluttering in, uh, in indignation or whether he was looking like a great thundercloud with sheer silent annoyance, I don't know. But he was brought to Jesus. Now, you see, there are people who say, there's no use forcing people to come to church. Well, I'm, I'm not at all sure about that. If what I'm saying about this story has any warrant at all. Well, it's open to question whether it's wise to, or not to force people to come to church. But what I think we should notice here, and perhaps this will challenge us greatly, and it should, I want us to notice the tremendous effort that these friends of the paralyzed man put expended in order to bring this man into the presence of Jesus. Sometimes we say, oh, I, oh, I've tried to bring this and that and the other to church, but they won't come. My friends, how hard have we tried? How persuaded have we been that the time had come and that the need of this person was to be brought to the presence of Jesus Christ without any delay at all? Now, you've heard me often from the pulpit saying, I've no time for this kind of, for, for buttonholing evangelism and that kind of thing. We're talking here about friends. And I think it is our bounden duty to be the instruments of God for the salvation of our friends. And I'm very impressed here with the effort that these fellows expended to bring this paralyzed man into the presence of Jesus. We have no idea how much they knew about the man's problem. Perhaps they knew more than the man realized. We don't know how much they understood of the man's problem. But it's quite clear from the story that these friends of the paralyzed man knew two very important things. They knew that they couldn't do anything to help him. I think in measure they had tried. 
This, this, this wasn't a situation that would resolve by the power of man. This needed divine power. They knew that they couldn't do anything. And they knew that he couldn't do anything. That was manifest. Sometimes people say to their friends or to their elder or to their minister, Oh, oh I'll manage. And the thing that is most obvious is that they're not managing and not likely to manage. And they took him to Jesus. Nothing, nothing put them off. There were all the crowd. Well, how, how do you get with a stretcher through a crowd that's, that's not disposed to break open and let you pass? Nothing put them off. They found their way around to the side of the back of the house, got up the, the outside stone stair onto the flat roof, and they opened up the roof. No, no, nothing was going to put them. The, their friend needed Jesus, and they were going to bring him to Jesus. I, I suppose you could almost apply here that, that verse that's really beyond understanding. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Well, they, they were determined to get their friend to Jesus. And it was the determination of faith. And their faith was manifest. You can imagine something of the, of the reaction of the crowd, you know, in, in the, both in the courtyard in the, and in the open plan house that no doubt Jesus was in. When, when the stuff began, the bits of, of matting and all that started to come down. What, what do they think they're doing? Who do they think they are? Oh, they knew perfectly well who they are and what they were doing. They were friends of this man, and their friend needed Jesus, and they were bringing him to Jesus. And maybe you're saying, oh, Mr. Philip, it would be so simple if they were paralyzed, and we could just cart them in the stretcher. We don't need to be narrowly physical in bringing people to Jesus. I think this shows us just how much we need to learn about prayer. This is how we take people to Jesus. And the story goes on to say that when Jesus saw their faith, and their faith was evident, it was evidenced by their attitudes and by their actions. But what does Jesus mean when, he, when it says, when he saw their faith? Does it apply to the four friends, if there were four, and the fellow lying on the, on the stretcher? If it does, then it is a phrase that signifies something that I'm increasingly learning and thrilling to. It speaks of corporate faith. agreement in faith. And this is something very, very important because both, both for action and for prayer. Because we find our Lord Jesus Christ saying, can I quote it to you in Matthew's Gospel, again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The agreement of faith. You have the same kind of thing in the epistle of James and in that passage about the healing of the sick at the end of the fifth chapter of James. Let him call for the elders. Corporate faith. You've no idea what it means to a minister to have his elders with him at a prayer meeting. Corporate faith. Agreement in faith. You've no idea what it means to a minister or a missionary to be aware of the fact that a whole congregation of God's people are agreed in faith to pray for them. Oh, I think individualism has been the scourge of the evangelical church. 
And we need to get back to thinking of the church as the church and the agreement of faith. I was looking up just when we were singing that last hymn, the marvelous story of Daniel, and oh, it's a great, great story. In Daniel chapter 2 at verse 17, you know, the decree of the king and all that kind of thing. Chapter 2, verse 17, listen to this. Then Daniel, Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek the mercy of the God of heaven concerning this mystery. My friends, my Christian friends, is this what you do when you've got a problem? Have you Christian friends to whom you can go and tell them so that in the agreement of faith you can spread the matter before the Lord? I was speaking last night, or was it in prayer last night, really about this kind of thing and applying it to the business of how we bring our covenant children within the sphere and the fellowship of the covenant of God's grace in infant baptism. I remember so well three times over standing down there and what it meant to me when the officiating minister called upon the congregation to stand in their places and to, to hear the, the, the noise as, as the whole congregation stood up and to become aware of the fact that the whole company of God's people were covenanting in the presence of God to pray for my children. Oh, what, a, oh, what an assurance and what an en encouragement in faith. When Jesus saw their faith, corporate faith, Oh, their prayer was answered. He, it couldn't be denied. But on the other hand, the phrase, when he saw their faith, it could apply to the friends uh, excluding the paralyzed man. And if that's what the story means, when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the man's friends, then the significance of this story, in measure at least, is concerned with vicarious faith. That is, faith standing in for another. Now, we mustn't drive this too far. You, you cannot stand in for someone else in terms of salvation. Your faith or my faith can never save another person. And yet, vicarious faith, standing in for another by faith, is biblical, spiritual, and powerful. I think I need give you only one scripture reference as we hurry on. It's in the story of Abraham and his intercession for Lot and his family in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah prior to the judgment of God. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 29, this is what we read. God remembered Abraham and delivered Lot. Now, whose, whose faith extricated that backslidden man, Lot, from the awful predicament that he was in? Not his own faith. He wasn't, dis he wasn't the kind of man who was disposed to pray. That's the awful tragedy of backsliders. They forget how to pray. They lose the motivation for prayer, the desire for prayer. And even sometimes when they find themselves in a terrible situation, they don't pray. I wonder how many backsliders there are here this morning. God knows. God looks on your heart. Oh, I pray, God, that you've got friends whose faith
still holds on on your behalf. I wonder how many people he are here this morning who are praying their hearts out for specific situations. Don't stop. Oh, this is the trouble with us. We often stop praying too soon. Pray, my friends. <coughs> Pray for those who won't pray for themselves. Listen to God on behalf of those who won't listen to God. When Jesus saw their faith, he spoke to the man and his word was with saving power. I've written down here in my notes how much we owe to the prayers and the integrity and the care of others without ever knowing it. Oh, my friends, I speak to you from my heart as I speak to myself. If you're getting on well in your Christian life just now, if God is blessing you, if God has given you the joy and the satisfaction of your heart's desire, if God has brought you out of, of difficulties and dangers, oh, my friends, be humble because you do not know that prayers and the tears that may be the key to your present joy and blessing. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Therefore let thy voice rise like a fountain for me night and day. For what are men better than sheep or goats if, knowing God, they lift not hands of prayer for those who call them friend? I sometimes wonder, I'm preaching at me, I sometimes wonder if we've begun to learn the secret and the significance of prayer. Corporate faith, vicarious faith. Think of this man, this paralyzed man, in terms of the past and the future. Think of this whole story in respect of our own past and future, not simply as individuals, but in the context of the work of God. Think of those who in the past, against all odds, preserved the truth in a place like this. Think of those who in the past on a wider scale, who at terrible cost, preserved the liberty of the gospel in this land of ours. Think of those men and women, oh, I'm thinking of their costly faith and what it cost them, no one will ever know. Those men and women of faith in past years who laid the foundation and created the atmosphere that made it so much easier for people like me to preach the gospel and to build a church. Think, think of faith in society as the salt and the light. Think, think of faith in the family and in the family of the church that gives the children the benefit of a healthy and holy start in life. Oh, it's not for nothing that we say to parents and to congregations that by prayer, precept, and example will bring up our children. Oh, my, my friends, how, how carefully we should come to church on a Sunday. I, I don't know that we should ever come to the Lord's house without first having sought God's face in prayer. So that we coming 
with hearts Godward, hearts opened, hearts clean. We might, forgive the phrase, we might create such an atmosphere of godliness that our youngsters, I and our teenagers, I and all of us and the stranger within our gates might be aware that God is in this place. We must hold on in faith, not least because this present generation is losing itself and in brokenness and bewilderment. And whatever our situation, this is, this is the word, us have faith in God. But think quickly in our remaining time of the paralytic and note that his basic need, according to Jesus, was not his paralysis. It was, not, it was not the bound, broken nature of his life that was the real need. It was his sins. It was as if Jesus looked at the man and said, Look here, my man, it's not your situation that's your problem, it's your sins. And you can almost imagine the man saying, or, or at least thinking, Who told you about my sins? Jesus doesn't need to be told. This was Jesus' word to the man, My son, your sins are forgiven. This was actually the first time that I think that Jesus ever spoke such words as these about the forgiveness of sins. And it was challenged by the Pharisees because they could see that he was, he was claiming divinity. He was claiming to be the Son of God with power to forgive sins. But this, this is the heart of the story and this is the heart of the Christian gospel. I know that there are many aspects and many applications of the Christian message. But the applications are not the message. And the message as was declared in Scripture is this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And this paralyzed man, his need was sin. Now we've got to be careful that we must never attribute a all illness to sin. We have reference to that in John chapter 9. Remember they asked about the blind man, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, oh, you're on the wrong level altogether. You'll never answer it on that level in this case. But Jesus makes it plain here that the man's deep need is not his body, nor his circumstances, but his soul. And having dealt with the spiritual sickness, the body... I believe, would have healed in due course. Is it not true that our generation is discovering the whole business of cause and effect in the question of wrong living, whether in the individual or in the family or in society? Sin brings consequences not only to ourselves, but to our children and to the next generation. Now I know that we mustn't read into this story, but it seems that the man's life or something that this man had done in his past life had led to his condition. Perhaps the man knew perfectly well what had caused his paralysis. On the, other hand, on the other hand, perhaps it was guilt that was paralyzing this man. Perhaps in his subconscious mind, in the whole realm of emotion is such a complicated one, perhaps this man was really punishing himself for something that he had done, something that he couldn't forgive himself, or so, something that was eating away like a great canker within him. Perhaps it was this that was paralyzing. Well, we can't tell. But Jesus knew. And Jesus spoke a word of forgiveness to this man 
forgiveness that was full and free and absolute and immediate. And when Jesus looked right into that man's heart and, and the man wasn't pleased, he, he, he didn't want his secret guilt to be known. He didn't want his sins to be spoken about. But when Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven, the word of Jesus lifted the secret burden from that man's mind and heart and spirit. The word of Jesus untied the knot that kept that man's feelings prisoner. The word of Jesus dispelled the guilt, whatever it was, whatever its source, however long it had been there. And it wasn't something that was gradual. And in order, in answer to the criticism of the Pharisees, and in order to signify that salvation was complete and immediate, he said to the man, take up your bed and walk. At some point, we cannot say when, at some point, this man must have had faith. Because without faith, there is no forgiveness. But what had his attitude been? Had he been brought to Christ in spite of himself? When he found himself in the presence of Christ, was he resentful? Was he rebellious? Was he submissive? I don't know. But you know the attitude and the disposition that you have here in God's house and in the presence of the Savior, here this morning. What do you want Jesus to do for you? Maybe you don't know what you need. When Jesus said to the man, Son, your sins are forgiven. I could imagine the man looking round to his friends and said, Did you tell him? Jesus doesn't need to be told. I don't even know if his friends knew about the sins that had ravaged his life. I doubt very much if the man would have admitted that these sins had caused all the bondage and hideous futility of his existence. But Jesus didn't argue the point. Jesus said, it's your sins that are the problem. Do you want me to deal with your sins? Because you see, my friends, you can't take your sins with you and go after Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. And Jesus showed this man that the very heart of life and of health and of hope is peace with God. Oh, my friends, are, are your sins dealt with? Are you reconciled to God? Maybe somebody saying, Oh, Mr. Philip, I was converted years ago, but oh, I've been a backslider, a secret backslider. Doesn't the Word of God say, I will heal your backsliding? And you know, when we're at peace with God, when we're reconciled to God, when we're restored to God, when, when we know that we are accepted by God, on that basis you can begin to accept yourself, not, not to stay as you are, but to accept yourself and to be set free from all bondage and given power to live. Oh, my friends, I love this story. Are you like this man, a paralytic, all tied up and shut in? Are you, as the authorized person would call him, 
sick of the palsy, your whole life always shaking, never at rest. Whether you know the source of it all or not, here's the word of God through Jesus Christ to you and to me this morning. And oh, what a word it is in his own precious voice, my son, my daughter, your sins are forgiven. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Amen, and may God bless to us his word. Now to close our service.